Welcome to another special report from Catholic Family News. This time we are honored to welcome back to our program Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who is going to be speaking to us from his home diocese in Kazakhstan. And our topic this evening is going to center around a book he recently published with Sophia Institute Press entitled Flee from Heresy, A Catholic Guide to Ancient and modern errors. So welcome back, Your Excellency. I hope you're doing well. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start off by asking you why you wrote a book about heresy at this particular time. Why, why do you think a book like this is needed at this time in history? It is so evident, and even a blind person can perceive it, that we are living in a time with an uh, enormous doctrinal confusion and a systematic spreading of errors in the life of the church and heresies. And therefore, it seemed to me important and necessary to address this topic on heresy. And you begin the book, as is always, I think, good, by talking about the, the word itself and, and some definitions. You talk about a broader and a more narrow meaning of heresy. But I think that's important because many times in, in public discourse today, you hear the word used just to, to mean error, plain and simple. Like, well, that person, that's wrong. That's a heresy. Um, and maybe could you help us understand what's the difference between just making a mistake or having an error in detail and a heresy in a, a strict sense? Well, the church it's, uh, herself gives us the clear meaning and definition. Hmm. What does mean heresy in the court of canon law? Uh, so heresy, according to the definition of the court of canon law, means um, a conscious, intentional, and obstinate denial mm -hmm. of a revealed divine truth, which the church um, proclaimed or proposed as such, as a divine, divine truth, and to be believed with divine faith, or a denial or a doubting. So, but the ex aspect here is obstinately with obstination. Mm. So this is uh, correct. Uh, this is the correct meaning, and uh, why it is so precise? Because it is a crime also, not only a sin but a crime uh, according to the canon law, and must be punished. It is punished with excommunication. So it is the heaviest punishment of the church and therefore one must be careful mm -hmm. in applying this concept, this term. And in that definition, I think you point to, or the church underscores, the, the subjective element of the crime and or the sin as distinct from the objective nature of a statement. So if we take the statement, um, Christ has three natures, we could say that's objectively a heretical proposition. It's, it's, it's not what the church teaches. But what more does one have to show that a person who says those words is, is actually committing the crime and even the sin of heresy on the subjective level? Yes, it is obstination. So, uh, and obstination, it uh, presupposes that this person had been uh, admonished or, mm. so, and then a reaction mm. against the admonishment. Then, when, when this person nevertheless continues to affirm or to spread such um, statements. This is becoming then uh, a, a sign of obstination. Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, I think that should be 
consoling for people of our time because we live in a time and and you've written about this in other places where there's not very much catechesis where many times people are not tra- taught the exact truths and so i think it's reassuring that people should understand they can't by accident commit the crime of heresy just because they didn't know something they they should have known that it's that they need to have been corrected and and say, well, I'm not going to change what I first thought was correct based on the church. Do, I don't know what you think. Do you, do, would you agree with that? Yes, yes, of course. I'm agreeing with this. Hmm. And so uh, we have to be uh, precise when we speak on heresy or when we, when we, when you are accused of heresy. Hmm. And uh, I repeat, because it is according to the church discipline uh, connected with a punishment of excommunication. Hmm. Well, and I think it's an interesting topic because, again, we live in very unusual times when almost any day you can do a search on the Internet and find someone accusing one of your fellow bishops or, sadly, the, the Holy Father of, oh, they've committed heresy, but without really thinking through in this way. They they um, just just want to throw the accusation out quickly. So I guess the first point with that, wh- whose place is it to judge the crime that someone has actually committed heresy? Well, um, ultimately, it's the church magisterium. Yes. Because uh, then it is the church must declare then the excommunication mm. when when this person is guilty mm. of crime of heresy mm. and this is the task of the church authority mm. and uh, w- well when the church authority does not act um, any well instructed person is able to to state that, for example, this this expression is an heresy. Yes, this is even a good instructed person in catechesis. When when someone says that Jesus Christ is not real present in the mystery of Eucharist, this is a plain heresy. Yes, and and everyone who has at least a fundamental uh, catechesis teaching he can understand this and state this also. Mm. And uh, throughout your your book, uh, which which again is available from Sophia Press, and uh, we will have a a link in this video uh, to where you can uh, purchase it, um, Flee from Heresy, you you do a history, you go through both a chronological and then a topical survey of the various heresies the church has encountered through through her mission in history. But I, I'd like to talk about two of them uh, in the next few minutes. The first is really not one heresy, but many, but I put under the umbrella of the Protestant heresy. And again, the, the, there's really many. Um, but I, it, do you think it's interesting or what would you, that in the past several decades, really since the 1960s, you often don't hear that word used with Lutheranism, Anglicanism, again, any of the different Protestant sects. Um, they're often referred to as separated brethren or, or other Christians. But I, I, it is often hard to find bishops and other members of the, the hierarchy referring to them as actual heresies. Why do you think that is? And, and do you think that that's a problem? Yes, uh, we have the statements of the Council of Trent, the solemn definitions, dogmatic definitions, where many formal heresies of Martin Luther and the other so-called Protestant reformers, which were not reformers, but Mm. deformers, I would call them, yeah. And as well as uh, the Anglican Church, which adapted uh, basically Calvinism, uh, were condemned. Uh, at least the, the 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 errors or the heresies of them. And we have to be conscious of this: that 
Protestantism and Anglicanism contain in their uh, theology, in their official teaching, um, um, a serious, uh, serious heresies. Now, how would you respond to some who say, uh, okay, but there are some parts of the faith that the, those Protestant sects still teach, um, and so there's good in there. Why are you focusing on the heresy or the error that's in there? Yes, it is um, because a heresy or an error is itself, in itself, something evil. Hmm. It is uh, harm. It is a kind of spiritual poison mm. because it is a contradiction to God's truth. So it is a, a temerarious mm. contradiction to what God revealed. God spoke and you say, no, this is not true. So it is a, a kind of even revolt against the word which God spoke and reveal to us mm. all the divine revealed truth are the word of God, which he addressed to us, the eternal truth, Christ himself, he is the truth in person, I am the truth. And so, and when people consciously reject or distort these truths. This is a revolt, a disobedience against God in a grave ma matter. Mm. And then to spread uh, this heresy, which is a um, contradiction to God, which is a deformation of God's word. This is harm. This is spiritual poison. So, when you have, let us say, a cake, a beautiful cake and there is maybe some one two small drops of a substance which is harmful for your health evidently harmful for your health and you say no i will not eat this mm. cake and people say why there are so many other parts <laughs> good and they're beautiful decorated please uh, just uh, accept this yeah i will not accept such a such a cake i will say no we have to first to purify these places from these spots or drops of harmful substance or poison and then we can continue then we can use it as a good and the, the second heresy I'd like to talk to you about is, again, like Protestantism, not, not one, but, but kind of a collection of heresies, and that is modernism, uh, which St. Pius X, is, as you write, called the, the synthesis of all, all heresies. And I, I don't know if you recall, about 10 years ago, uh, a cardinal, uh, Oscar uh, Madragas, uh, um, who was fairly close to, to the Holy Father, gave a speech here in the United States where he said that uh, modernism had been condemned, but the church reconciled to modernism in his interpretation at Vatican II. Um, and, and is my question to you is, is that thesis possible? Can the church ever reconcile to, to a heresy like modernism? This is not possible because uh, modernism is truly a synthesis of all heresies mm -hmm. because the foundation of modernism is relativism and this is the most dangerous it is a destroyal of truth itself mm. any foundations and uh, modernism basically uh, promotes uh, relativism philosophical, doctrinal, rel oral relativism. It means that there is no constant and perennial validly truth. Mm. So uh, every uh, historical period uh, establishes its own truth. Mm. 
mm. according to the historical development of humanity or a, or a subject. So therefore, according to the relativist theory, what was um, held as true, maybe uh, in the past time, can in our time be uh, the contrary and be for us truth. So this is so uh, dangerous and uh, it is really the destroyal of, of any notion of truth itself. But uh, in this attitude of relativism is, is contained the other dangerous tendency which, uh, which says that human being, he establishes what is true and what is not true, or historical period, human beings, what is good and what is evil. So it is, a, you, you, <clears throat> they usurped the divine right to establish and to create truth and good. Mm. And therefore, the modernism is so dangerous with this basic attitude of relativism. And I think dangerous in another sense, as Pope Pius the Saint Pope Pius the Tenth said, as well as Pope Pius the Twelfth, the modernist is very difficult to pin down or to get condemn of heresy um, because their use of words is often changing. So, for example, they might affirm a statement of the church, outside the church there's no salvation, for example, but then uh, interpret that in a way or apply a meaning to the formula where that is not, not uh, orthodox. So, what is our obligation with respect to the definitions the church has given? Is it just to repeat the words or can those same words take on different meanings as some modernists try to try to claim? The church follows this uh, principle which was formulated already in the time of the fathers of the church, hmm. uh, specifically by St. Vincent of Lerins. Hmm. that the same dogma and truth must be interpreted always in the same meaning, in the same sense that all the time uh, had. So, the, this is important. Uh, it can be, the understanding of the dogma can be deepened but always in the same sense, in the same meaning. And when an understanding or an interpretation starts to, to undermine the truth or to contradict it even slightly or to, to put it in an um, ambiguous uh, interpretation, then it is not a correct understanding, it's not a deepening, it's not a true um, increase of, of knowledge, of faith, but the contrary. So with that, maybe we can take an example that, that you write about and have written about uh, before, and that is if someone is living a lifestyle of mortal sin, so for example, living and engaging in acts as if husband and wife with someone that they are not to whom they're not legally married can they go to receive the sacraments confession absolution and the the blessed eucharist without resolving to leave that situation of course not yeah. this this was constantly mm -hmm. taught by the church uh, it is a contradiction. They contradict themselves and they contradict mm. the constant practice and teaching of the church. And it would be a public lie, simply, or a public 
uh, outrage of the Blessed Sacrament, a desecration, because they say we believe, let us say, in the indissolubility of the marriage. Mm -hmm. Or even bishops say, say that yes, <laughs> the, the dogma of faith remains that marriage is in this in this in this soluble but in practice we can adapt another way mm -hmm. uh, in this case this the, those who live in a unlawful union and as has uh, husband and wife they are committing a grave uh, sin and give a public scandal, contradicting the will of God in a very important issue, Sixth Commandment. It's not an ecclesiastical law, it is a law of God. And um, receiving Holy Communion, they they harm their souls because St. Paul says it's a divine teaching because it's holy scripture that if someone eats and drinks uh, in unworthy in this case in a state of sin he eats and drinks his own her own judgment condemnation it is serious and so these people are committing a even uh, more grievous sin, not only living in sin against the will of God regarding the Sixth Commandment, but also uh, desecrating the most holy sacrament which got established in the Church, the Holy Eucharist. So this is a more grievous sin. They accumulate these sins and put ever more uh, the salvation of their souls in danger. And so churchmen who allow such communions, they are committing, they are cruel, really cruelty. And um, this is the contrary of love for neighbor. This is a false, hmm. fake love for neighbor they are like a, a, a doctor physician who will uh, give deliver for the patients some poison uh, maybe decorate it with with something beautiful or when even when he will give not a poison but something good objectively, but which is harmful for the health of these concrete persons. So when it, when someone is suffering of diabetes, he cannot eat sugar and so on. And the doctor will prescribe them and say, you can, you can, uh, you can surely eat this. And he will be responsible. He will be responsible for the, even for the death of this person. And this is the same, even more responsible and worse in the case of the soul than of the body. Mm. Well, in, in that respect of, of needing medicine, I, the very first time I saw your name, this was many, many years ago, uh, early, I think it was even in the pontificate of Benedict XVI, I remember you called for a new syllabus of errors to condemn sort of the errors that have grown up since the time of the Second Vatican Council. Do you still think that that's a remedy that the church uh, needs at this time? And, and do you have any hope that, that that might happen in our times? Yes, of course, mm -hmm. because we are living in such a confused time mm -hmm. when in the life of the church <clears throat> are being spread so many errors, mm -hmm. so many spiritual diseases. And when you are a responsible physician, doctor, and you are observing the spread of diseases, mm. and many various diseases, 
it is your obligation to warn people or to make a list and say, please attention, these, these, these phenomenons are harmful for your health. And this is the, the same when you, when the church makes a list, syllabus means a list <clears throat> to, of spiritual, harmful, dangerous diseases, which are the errors and, her and heresies. <clears throat> and therefore it would be a great expression of charity towards the souls when the church authorities would uh, establish and publish such a syllabus of errors. And it could be done maybe practically in, the, in a new formula of profession of faith. Uh, which is a detailed list of the common, most common errors of our time, mm. enumerating them and saying why they are harmful, contradicting the church teaching, uh, and who is everyone who will be, let us say, become Catholic or be ordained or have a uh, uh, office in the church must then uh, make this detailed profession of faith where the main heresies would be enumerated. Like the oath against modernism, for, for example. Yes, for it, yes, 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 yes. Exactly. So we've been th speaking about uh, Bishop Athanasius Snyder's book, Flee from Heresy. You can purchase it from this direct affiliate link. Uh, as our viewers may know, Catholic Family News has a cooperation affiliate uh, program with Sophie Institute Press. So a portion of your proceeds uh, will go to support videos like this. This will also be in the description. Um, before we go, Your Excellency, I'd like to ask you about a timely topic that many of our readers have been um, concerned with and have been struck with confusion, because as we've been talking about, there are sadly many theologians, priests, and even sadly bishops in the church who are uh, promoting heresy, promoting immoral behavior. Um, and in, in light of that, many of them seem not to be judged by the church. But in early July, a judgment did come from the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, declaring an excommunication, Lady Citancia, against uh, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano. And I, I'd like to get your opinion on that. I, uh, first, I'd like to ask you to explain to our, our readers, is your reading of the decree, because some people have claimed Archbishop Vigano was punished for heresy. First, could you clear up, is, is that actually what was said? And is that true? No, to my understanding, in my understanding, it is he was formally punished of the crime of her of schism, yes. not of heresy. Yes, and uh, and this is. But as you mentioned, I lament that uh, so many bishops and clergy who are plainly, openly spreading heresies, mm. <laughs> they are not punished. This is unjust. This is a double measure. And in some aspect, heresy is more dangerous than schism. Mm. Schism is traditionally defined it's against charity and unity, whereas heresy it is deeper, it is, it is undermining the foundations of all our faith itself. Mm -hmm. So it is more dangerous. And this is, uh, I lament that so many clergymen are this strictness of the Holy See, mm -hmm. with which it reacted against um, statements or schismatic statements of Bishop Archbishop Vigano, uh, did should be applied the more 
to concrete heretical clergymen, mm-hmm. church, and these I lament. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, more specifically, and, and maybe you haven't looked at it enough, but if you had, do you think this judgment of schism then is is just against Archbishop Vigano, or do you think it's not just? Well, I lament also, I regret that Archbishop Vigano is basically um, promoting and, and stating sede uh, vacantism because he does not recognize uh, the validity, the authority of the reigning pontiff, mm. Pope Francis, which the entire church, this is important, the entire church, mm-hmm. the entire episcopacy, the entire college of cardinals, since his election, recognized him and is recognizing as the valid pope. And so, this was the constant and more sure tradition of the church. Mm-hmm. We had in the history of the church several cases of evident invalid papal elections. It would be very good to study carefully the history of the papacy. And there were. But subsequently, the peaceful or the de facto acceptance of an invalidly elected pope by the majority of the episcopate and the faithful uh, made this pope then de facto a valid pope and the church, the Holy See, uh, recognized these popes as valid. In the list, in the Annuario Pontificio, there are many cases with uh, when you research history were evidently invalid. And the election mode, it is not a divine law. Mm -hmm. And what is not divine law has not an absolute validity, an absolute value. So this is the error of Archbishop Vigano. He establishes a human law, which is the law of an election of a pope, he absolutizes it. Mm. And this is not according to the constant and perennial uh, meaning and tradition and practice of the Catholic Church of the Holy See. And then also the issue of heretical pope, it is still a theory of theologians, even saint theologians. It is not an official teaching of the magisterium, not. And we have to distinguish this. And then to quote only one Pope, Paul IV, with his uh, bull about heretical Pope, it is not sufficient because it was not an ex cathedra definition. The church never recognized this bull as an infallible teaching. Mm-hmm. No pope uh, and, uh, and his successors did not continue and did not repeat in their public statements and bulls and, and constitutions what Paul the the Fourth established. And therefore, the contrary, the old canon law uh, for example, the Corpus Juris Canonici, it was a collection of canon law until 1917, mm. and there was contained an expression of the 12th century that the Pope cannot be judged by no one mm. unless he deviates from the faith. In this sense, uh, he will be heretic. But the magisterium of the church did not teach it. Uh, the popes did not teach it in their documents, with exception of only one pope in the 16th century. So this is not sufficient. One pope is not sufficient. It must be a perennial, a constant teaching of the church. And then, the contrary, the court of canon law of 1917 which was called the Code of Pius and Benedict, the Popes, Pio Benedictinum, 
uh, they removed this phrase of the old corpus juris canonici. So if it would be the sense of the church to continue with this and what said Paul the fourth, they would uh, have not removed this phrase from the canon law, but it was removed in 1917 and not more repeated. Mm. So this is simply a fact we have to consider to be truly the mean, the Catholic meaning and the sense centiricum ecclesia, which is, I repeat, it must be perennial, constantly through the centuries, uh, maintained, repeated, not by theologians only, but by the magisterium of the church. And until now, it is a theory or an opinion of theologians, but not an official teaching of the church. Mm. I don't know if you'd agree, but it's been my opinion for some time that one of the dangers of a, a state of a contest position is the danger of curiosity. You want to know everything. Is this theory correct? What would happen if this Pope did that? And rather than understanding there may be some facts or things about the temporal life of the church that we may not know in this lifetime and that are left up to God, and that we don't really need to to worry too much about these things because the church has given us the the principles to live upon the truths and whatever's happening at the highest level of the church we can proceed to save our souls do you think that that is a uh, that opinion is a good opinion in the way to think about this matter or would you correct something in that yes okay. i think the basic <clears throat> error of sedevacantists is one of their basic errors. Yes. It's that they <clears throat> infallibilize absolutely the Pope. So mm -hmm. that the Pope is 24 hours infallible. Yes. And this is not Catholic. This is a, mm -hmm. a distortion of the Catholic dogma of infallibility. The infallibility is very precisely <laughs> defined uh, and there are conditions of to be an expression infallible. And the, the church says, canon law, a doctrine is not infallible unless it is clearly manifested as such. Unless it is clearly manifested as such. So we cannot simply that this is infallible what the Pope speaks or, or his documents. They are not, they must be very careful exam, examined if this is. And so the people who promote sedevacantism, they commit this basic error to of a total or absolute infallibilization of the papal uh, magisterium. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when they state an error, an ambiguity, an her or a material heresy of uh, of a Pope who, who or of the council and so on, they, they make the wrong um, consequence yes. and saying that there, are no, there is no magisterium, there is no Pope. And the other, which you mentioned, it's a lack of trust and supernatural vision mm. of the indestructibility of the church, that in spite of evident errors spread even by a pope, uh, that God is still guiding his church, and God is um, holding the church in his in his hands mm. and and this phenomenon <clears throat> of doctrinal confusion <clears throat> spread by <clears throat> even our pope <clears throat> is only <clears throat> temporal mm. it is temporal we have to 
<clears throat> to wait. And then the God will intervene, as he did in the past, simply study the history of the church. <clears throat> and he will intervene, it is his church. And this set uh, of attitudes, it is also a kind of a human solution. Now we take in our hands the situation and we will resolve it. We will simply declare the Pope is not Pope. Mm -hmm. or we will elect a new pope or we will we will establish a committee or a kind of imperfect council as in other expressions they invent then it is all a human solution in an issue which can only basically and ultimately resolve god himself yes. as christ manifested it at that time, <clears throat> during the storm uh, on the sea, where the disciples were with him on the boat and, and started a, a huge <clears throat> storm and the waters came in, in the boat, and they were incapable to resolve the situation. And only the Lord, he stood up, he was sleeping, but he stood up, <clears throat> and ordered, commanded to the wind and storm to be silent. And this the, the Lord will do also in our time. So these <clears throat> um, said evacuantists, uh, several, they lack the basic trust, supernatural trust, that the Lord will intervene. It is not uh, promotion of our passivity. They say some say then respond. Oh, uh, you are you are simply passive and do nothing. We do, we do. We can and must. In such cases, um, admonish the Pope, yes. advise him respectfully, not with irrespectful language which unfortunately Archbishop Vigano is using sometimes, must respectfully admonish him to help him and uh, to spread the true faith. This we can, this is activity. And uh, pray for the Pope, do penance for the Pope, do expiation for him, reparation. This is very much active. It's not passive. Hmm but leave to the Lord his task. It's not your task to depose the Pope and to declare him not Pope. It is the Lord who will do this through his church after this pontificate. But better that we must implore with fervent prayers that the Pope before he dies will have the grace, the immense grace of God mm. to reflect, to retract all his ambiguities and all what he did, what was contributing to confusion. Oh, very, very well said. Thank you. And uh, please, we highly again recommend considering Flee from Heresy, which you can obtain from Sophia Institute Press. We'll have a link in the description. Uh, thank you for getting up so early in the morning, your time, Your Excellency, to, to join us. And uh, we will continue to pray for you and your, your work in the church. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Mm -hmm. Thank you.